Okay, folks, hi, we'll kick off. For those of you in Tokyo, you know it's more gray weather. Um, if you're not in Tokyo, I hope you're in a better place weather-wise. Um, I fear not, but uh, anyway. Right, lots of things to do today. First of all, I want to double back and talk a little bit about um, communication design, particularly with um, one very short example and one slightly longer example that will be familiar to you, uh, Dimoa. Uh, just a couple of things in terms of where we are with uh, your projects and uh, submissions and information about your next project. Uh, first of all, of course, um, noon on Thursday, the due date for uh, A1, uh, what you like. And the mechanism for uploading that is already established on the website. You can see that there. I sent a message on the weekend, a long weekend, uh, sorry, a long message on a short weekend. Uh, detailing um, just, yeah, the mechanism for actually uploading that separately, the collaboration log, which only one group member needs to upload. Okay. Uh, what I've also subsequently done is I've uploaded an elaborated, uh, more detailed description of your next task, A2. You're not even done with this one. I'm already bombarding you hastily about the next one, I know, but um, the semester is so short, I need to do that. Mind you, you've known about both of them since week one, so you have been able to get underway with it if you're inclined. Um, I am very conscious that uh, there are 92 people in the class. Uh, we have 82 participants today. Um, don't know where 10 people have gone, but anyway, that's their, that's their choice, although I'm going to take a note of who's attending in a moment. Um, so I'm conscious that uh, when I checked earlier at about 11 a.m., we've so far have five people who's who have uploaded the A1 activity. Thank you very much to those of you who have done that. That's just to me, of course, it's all working as planned. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't, okay. So for everyone, once you're done with the uh, upload, of course, and you've got so many other courses, do turn your attention to this um, expanded description, I call it here, okay. Um, and very importantly, let me touch the focus here to no, it just wants to focus on me. Okay. No one else does, but the camera does. Okay. Um, A2 project plus significantly A1, A2 personal learning log. Okay. Maybe easy to forget this. It's, it's actually been roughly detailed right from the beginning of the semester as in the very bottom of the description of A2. Um, and anyway, it comes right down the bottom here. So it's a, I call it a log, but it's more of a reflective kind of log. I don't expect you to keep a, kind of a detailed diary of everything you're doing. Um, but it's uh, really about a reflective diary mentioning key learning points, techniques, and apps you've used for both of those tasks, how you came to find out about them, uh, what was your base knowledge level when you started out this on this task. Some people already uh, very familiar with the, um, the things you need to do. So digital scrapbooking, for example. Um, some people already knew about um, e-publishing. Um, not generally expecting people to use e-publishing, by the way, like EPUB, but um, if uh, that is one of the few people, uh, if that is you, one of the few people who know that, then by all means for the A1. Okay, so existing level of relevant uh, skills you brought to the tasks and uh, then how much personal learning personal learning was realized um, and then I ask a final evaluative thing whether this all this kind of digital visual work is for you or not okay so particularly as you're going on to the next uh, thing the, the uh, three minute personal video um, keep uh, some track of your time frame in terms of developing those skills. Um, and in particular, uh, and I haven't seen as much of it as I had hoped, but in particular, remember there is a 15% participation component for the entire course. And I was really encouraging students to actively share things they might've come across that would be helpful for um, everybody. And I explicitly said, don't be afraid to share what you've discovered, uh, that the payoffs uh, for being very collegial and sharing um, interesting apps, for example, techniques, are much larger than just keeping them to yourself and doing a good project, okay? Uh, so I really do want to crowdsource in some sense the, um, the sources of wisdom. You know, if a fellow group member said, why don't you use this? Uh, do this technique or whatever and it was hugely helpful it's a win-win 
it shows you that, that you're a learning reflective individual growing through advice and also I can reward the other people who are very generous with the, uh, the know-how. Okay, um, let's have a look. Uh, participants, we're at 83, okay. Um, now, just a simple way of taking attendance here, the simplest way to do this, rather than me trying to hurriedly look through the ever-shifting list of participants. Everybody knows where the chat function is, I assume, okay. All I want everyone to do now is just enter a letter nine like I'm about to do now okay so if you just go into the chat menu okay chat and you kind of it's funny because chat appears at the bottom um, in the middle of the screen but it's over on the right hand side make sure it's to everyone the blue um, it's actually disabled so the in, the individual messaging between students um, I disabled that because Otherwise, there's a f usually a few guys who want to hit on class members they see in breakouts and stuff like that and become digital stalkers So um, to avoid that. Okay, that's why you can't generally message each other. Um, so to everyone, just put in a nine and hit return like I've just done. Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Because then what I can do is um, I can do a uh, um, export of the text file and it shows everyone's name and exactly when they did it, okay? Um, I noticed a couple of people logging in, they had mates with them, so those of you not in the class but viewing, hope you enjoy it. Don't distract your friend or beloved or whatever, okay? Um, so I, I, I don't mind if I have a larger audience, okay, as long as it's a well-behaved audience. Um, I did have one clown two years ago in this very class who came in after about five minutes, decided that wasn't his thing and decided to do three cartwheels in the um, aisle on the way out um, to the enormous embarrassment of his friend. Okay. So, okay. Uh, let's uh, go straight over to content uh, share. Someone is unmuted with a bit of BGM happening. So if you could kill that, because that ain't me. I'm in my deathly quiet office with a um, unidirectional mic that should only pick up me. In fact, I think someone could be very painfully murdered in the corridor outside and you wouldn't hear a sound because it's a very narrow unidirectional mic. And one thing on that, by the way, um, uh, in relation to the next project, I've given a lot of tips about basic setup, basic equipment, stuff like that to make a half decent video, um, including some apps, but some really more basic stuff about, you know, doing it with your phone and things like that. Um, and I've posted all of that stuff over on the, uh, course website, designingcc.wordpress.com. Okay. And it's under the assessment page. I don't talk about the assessment there because it's on Moodle. So instead there, there's a lot of stuff there. I will add some more links. Um, the first tip I give is, of course, um, that if you're going to be doing it with your phone or your camera or whatever, stabilization is absolutely fund some fundamental. I haven't actually, because I didn't really want to pressure people to spending money, um, spend money. So I don't want, want people to kind of rush out and buy a DJI, you know, um, gimbal or the Ichimung Sun Zen or something like that. Um, it's much better just to invest in, I'll show you here. I got a, this rather cool looking um, Manfrotto, oh, sorry, the sound's going to go bad. This rather cool looking um, Manfrotto little mini tripod, which also comes um, with a nice screw on iPhone holder, or uh, not specifically iPhone. Um, and for the princely sum of about 1900 yen, okay, and it actually looks pretty cool. And so it's very good if you're doing Zoom nomike um, or you need to shoot video or whatever. Um, also, if you, if you do have a digital camera, and I think many of you will have, though more and more people just use their phone, um, it starts off with the uh, regular quarter inch mount. So you can actually mount uh, a camera directly on that. And uh, that means you don't really need to invest in things like a much larger tripod, you know, my, where you can, you can easily buy a, um, like a Manfrotto, polycarbonate, super light, stable tripod that costs Juni Manin, okay? You don't have to, you know, you can, uh, no, once you start to look at really hardcore gear, um, 
my own tripod, my most recent one, my other one's a bit crappy, but my, my current setup is a, um, a lovely, robust, slick, wonderful Japanese, beautifully engineered thing that cost me about some mongol sent in. So I'm not expecting that with 2000 yen and a table or a chair to put it on or a few books, you know, just stack it up on top of the table, get the camera height right and whatnot. Um, you can do to some of your two camera pieces there. Um, you can also go and seek outdoor locations, for example, where you actually can find somewhere to put it on. Okay. Um, the cool thing about something like this is that it actually has a uh, unidirectional head. So you can also balance, balance it up and all the rest of it. Um, there are lots of little tips in videos that I've added on the website. Some really basic things like, you know, get your camera horizontal. Um, no excuses for that with an iPhone because uh, you actually can turn on grid lines in the camera and there actually is a, spirit, a virtual spirit level as one of the, uh, the default apps with an iPhone. I imagine if you're in the, um, that other world. I have always a mental block in the, uh, the non-Apple world, okay? Um, you uh, can find plenty of apps to do the same thing. Okay, so I'll speak briefly on communication design, and then I'm going to kind of force march you a little bit through the stuff on spatiality, because uh, there's a lot of material I want to cover. Um, a lot of it is actually just, just examples. So you, uh, in a sense, can look through them yourself, but at the same time, you want to see why I'm putting them there. They're not necessarily self-explanatory because lo and behold, um, as we talked about last week, um, the meaning of images is rather more open than often the person who's using them um, intends. Okay, so first of all, visual communication, design. Now, of course, that it's a bit of a miss misleading title here. Of course, that sounds like a comprehensive discussion of visual communication design. It's not that at all, actually. Um, I really should say examples, but I've just mentioned a couple of examples to show how in unexpected ways and places, there's a very strong visuality that figures into product development, for example. Okay, um, so obviously visuality is very broad in scope. Um, text itself also is visual, okay? That's all exactly what semiotics is about. It, it tells us about how language functions as a sign. Uh, and of course, in all societies that are non-literate, text uh, just simply appears as a sign, something that cannot be decoded without the assistance of others. Uh, this actually introduces interesting questions when, for example, you roll out democratic electoral processes in societies with high levels of illiteracy. You know, in the Solomon Islands, for example, in Papua New Guinea, in remote tribal areas, um, candidates standing for parliament, and both of those countries are quite vibrant democracies, um, candidates standing for parliament normally have a logo as well as their name, of course, you know, so it might be a pineapple, it might be a banana, or it might be a whatever, okay? Um, and so this is for illiterate voters can identify the candidate they want simply by seeing the logo and making a mark next to the logo. Now, of course, when language crosses um, linguistic boundaries, that is, uh, it enters into the realm of non-speakers of that language, non-readers of that language, effectively English becomes, for example, or whatever language becomes ornament. Be extraordinarily careful about this. Uh, we have seen um, ignorant tourists going to places like Sri Lanka in the past, wearing something that they, a t-shirt that they thought was really cool, some surfwear or whatever, which um, has Sanskrit written on it. And it's actually a completely bastardized religious text. And they get themselves in trouble for disrespecting Buddhist faith, for example. So, you know, whenever you wear text, be careful whether you understand it or not. Okay, and I've mentioned uh, some examples previously about this. I think actually that's one reason why the English has been so bad in Japan for so long, to a significant degree, Historically, English has just functioned as ornament rather than as communications. And so people have become quite indifferent to bad English. Okay. Uh, what we do see is we, uh, the use of text and image coming back together, not just for the technical reasons that we spoke about earlier uh, last week, but also 
within the creative arts themselves. More and more, if you go to art exhibitions, you will see uh, visual arts that use substantial or singular pieces of text, for example, interposed with um, other elements of visuality. So there's obviously a very strong graphic design development um, element that we we all understand. So this is this is about making the text visually attractive, and the other way around, just using text as ornament. Okay, um, but there's some other really significant development um, elements here too um, with visuality. Surface treatments themselves are quite significant. The difference between matte and gloss, just in terms of the experience of the product, and I mentioned uh, previously that. Um, matte is much more on trend than gloss in in many ways that actually these days if you want to make a product look really cheap package it in a glossy package okay uh, there are various reasons for this partly matte um, just simply is considered more restrained and a little more tasteful partly it looks a little more artisanal it has a little bit of the look of the hand printed screen print for example onto maybe recycled papers. So there are these elements here. Um, but also the way that printing technologies evolved and particularly surface treatments with the covering of um, a shiny veneer, that that actually has become a super cheap mass um, process. And as a consequence, matte finishes generally are more expensive than glossy treatments. So we tend to see that even when uh, there are practical reasons, for example, to make a package relatively waterproof, there are some quite expensive treatments that give it a, a veneer seal that also have a, a, a matte or a semi-matte semi finish. You only need to look at the box that any um, Apple product comes in, for example, to, to see what I'm talking about there. So there are a whole range of kind of tactile elements with the, uh, the experience of a product that actually has a... Uh, uh, even a, an, an experienced, seemingly two-dimensional element in the sense that light uh, reflects, reflect, refracts in slightly different ways. Um, and so though it seems ostensibly two-dimensional, if you were to look at a very, uh, at a very micro level, it's actually quite three-dimensional. That's impacting how the surface appears and, and everything that's um, printed and rendered onto it appears. Okay. So, of course, th full three-dimensional form is separate from this. You can, you can have a box that can be glossy or it can be matte or whatever. We, get, we understand these things. Of course, when we move towards the de design of spaces and installations, these have very significant three-dimensional elements. And, of course, the product itself is very significant. We'll talk about this later on. And uh, form becomes a key discourse here. So you can distinguish between uh, form and material in discourse terms. Now, sometimes people do really clever things with the form. They take what is a stock standard box and make it more interesting for the user. In this particular case, this is butter fudge from English, uh, from England, the ultimate English butter fudge. But it's not just that the, uh, the box opens in an, in an unusual way. What this actually does is it effectively doubles the communicative space, uh, the two dimensional space that is available to the graphic designer because the box effectively opens up and provides a place uh, in which the company's story can be told and an extraordinarily effective one because effectively the product sets, sits um, or is set in uh, the middle of the narrative about the product's origins in the first place rather than being just around the sides with all of those regulatory driven packaging requirements and maybe on the bottom and whatnot. So now, with packaging, of course, uh, one of the, uh, the challenges is increasingly to be environmentally sustainable. And we've noticed significantly the major burger chains, for example, have moved towards paper wrapping of product rather than those of what we would call um, uh, Coolite in Australia, that's actually a brand name, Stylophone packages and whatnot. Uh, with, of course, paper packaging, wrapping your hamburger, this also prevents a uh, presents, sorry, not prevents, presents a communication um, opportunity, as you see here with Burger King. You can read it yourself, um, but a quite cute kind of narrative there. Fonts, of course, um, we all understand the sheer power of fonts, and hopefully you've all played with fonts. You've got an astonishing array of fonts available to you with um, 
uh, the basic word processing software that you use these days. And if you want some more, you can, you can Google and find hundreds of fonts that you can download for free. So it's very interesting to think about fonts and the personalities they have. Um, so many fonts are very strongly associated with a particular era, historical period, if you want to speak uh, to uh, audiences and suggest um, Art Deco, for example, late 20s, 1930s, font selection gets this, 1970s, 60s or whatever. Um, and then of course you can make a whole range of associations with institutions and their cultures. So if you were to look here in this slide, um, fonts, 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 the one right at the top there um, is so much associated with the US college letter jacket look. Um, and so you see an enormous number of cheap clothing brands kind of making up college names. And if they're smart, they make them up, otherwise they're in danger of getting sued. And they use the stock standard um, font to give it that leather jacket kind of look. And so it, it, it kind of hints to, you know, Ivy League, campus casual, um, which is, has global currency uh, as, a, as a particular um, look in casual wear, for example. By the way, there's a really wonderful history on this in the Japanese case, uh, which is very nicely discussed in a great book by David Marks, very bright chap, um, who I understand currently works for Google, but his great book called is Ametora, American Traditional, originally in English, but it's also published in um, Japanese, and a lovely chap too. Okay, so let's return to the photograph. Of course, we've heard about the photograph in terms of Roland Barthes and Susan Sontag theorizing about it. Uh, let's just simply look at a couple of examples. Um, this case is particularly associated with um, Ishioka Eko, very avant-garde um, creative who was doing work early for Shiseido, Paroko, um, and very significantly on the website. Those of you who are well ahead of the material on the website, um, may have missed the fact that I've actually moved some material, which was already on the website, but it was in the blog feed. I've actually moved it to this topic, okay? I've moved it to under 13 and 14. So hopefully all of you had seen that. I reminded you that before the, uh, the last uh, quiz, but have a look again if you hadn't seen that. Um, and of course this copy here, you know, translating from the Japanese says that it's not enough than moral to have a good face, okay? Okay, so this was very significant for its time because what Ishioko Eko and the executives at Paco, who had a lot of faith in her, were doing were really um, confronting uh, cultural constructs of femininity, of women's roles, of um, how appropriate it was for a woman to be forthright, to be energetic, to be passionate. So there's no accident, of course, that color, uh, the color red, um, which is so much associated with passion that we've talked about, the bodily pole, you know, the, the, the body language and all the rest of it is a uh, very forward oriented, um, bold, aggressive um, posture. And of course, that's what Parker wanted to be. Parker was very edgy at its time as a fashion retailing space. Okay. And uh, we see another, another one as well here, uh, of course, showing very diverse faces and again, a uh, very different take on femininity. So this is not Yamato Nadeshko. Okay, so let's link this to design thinking. And I really want to focus just in this brief example on form and function to emphasize that uh, the visuality uh, dimension is not just graphic design. That's the most obvious and we can track changes very clearly in terms of what happens with advertising campaigns um, over time. But then actually this goes very hard to the feature, uh, to basic product features. And I'm sure many of you will have been thinking about that uh, in terms of our exercise where you're focusing on your tastes, what you like. Okay, so it's about form and material and then how that interrelates uh, with brand and brand stories. Okay, so we've already talked about redescription, so we really don't need to, to get um, deeply into it, just simply to remind us that we have both narratives and norms about products, firms, consumer expectations, and that these can actually become a barrier to creative problem specification. Okay, so very often people develop 
a mindset about what a product should be and tell stories about what the uh, customer expectations are in relation to that product. And we can end up with some interesting effects here where there is an almost freezing of product development of an industry because everyone just becomes so accustomed to the established form and imagery of a product. I don't know who said it originally. I'm sure some of you could Google and tell me in an instant, um, but there is, don't, okay. Um, there is a very famous um, anecdote that um, human beings put a man on the moon before they put wheels on a suitcase. And that really is a striking insight. Uh, we shouldn't assume that naturally people in an industry have an innovation orientation. There's an extraordinary degree of conservatism, particularly people who come into an industry. Uh, they're initially suffering if they've got any modesty whatsoever, a degree of imposter syndrome. Can I really do this? And uh, maybe some of them explicitly are following that old adage, fake it till you make it. Um, and uh, once they eventually do master the logics, the narratives, the discourses, the practices, the personalities, the structural dynamics, the market dynamics in a, in a, in a product space, they're often very hesitant to upend that by really changing some fundamental assumptions, assumptions because they've worked so hard to master those assumptions in the first place. And very often their status in relation to their juniors, for example, their own, own junior employees, um, those who work under them, under the direction, if you're a middle manager, for example, very often their status depends on their mastery of that. So that there's a lot of resistance in organizations. But if you can look carefully at customers and honestly see how a product is adding value to them, but also what is the customer's pain point? And this is a very common discourse in the application of design thinking and design product development in general. Where are the pain points when people are using products? Um, all of you have traveled, if you don't have wheels on your suitcase, um, lumping a heavy suitcase around uh, can really take the shine off your travel. I think uh, we've all, if you haven't been there yourself, seeing someone who's had that horrible experience of dragging a heavy suitcase through the subway, for example, and because you didn't take someone's advice, um, you bought the cheap suitcase and the wheel breaks off, okay? Um, nightmare. Well, actually, when I first traveled uh, through Europe, uh, when I was quite young, um, I was backpacking it because uh, suitcases with wheels were, there were a few around, but they were kind of clumsy and they tended to tip over. So the backpack seemed to be the thing to do. Um, and for the two months that I traveled around Europe, I was in a constant state of kind of agony because I was hauling so much weight around with me. Partly it's because I had all my camera gear and everything, which was all damn heavy in those days. Um, but uh, yeah later on when suitcases became lighter and they also had wheels on them this became a significant impetus for people to actually travel carrying with more stuff rather than less there are still a whole bunch of people and i find they tend to be older people rather than younger people um, who have this kind of travel routine of only taking some quick two pairs of quick dry underpants and three pairs of socks or whatever and um, washing them every night in their hotel room and um, drying them and uh, so trying to travel as absolutely as light as possible. Then you see what they're carrying in like a backpack. It's like, wow. Uh, I certainly do not want at the end of a long day or a work day or a great day or whatever, having to wash my undies in the hotel every single night and hope that they're dry by the morning. I would much rather have a lighter suitcase with some wheels on it so that I actually can carry enough for a trip and um, maybe extend my trip unexpectedly. What we know is that very often firms' best assets can be the existing trust that they have, okay? And maybe the aesthetics of the product, and very often the aesthetics is tied in the consumer's minds with the trust in that brand. Now, a very important thing here is that a brand works to give you um, an opportunity uh, for customers to come with you in new directions or to forgive you if you screw up okay a band a, a brand effectively gives you some leeway okay some latitude uh that others don't so by building a strong brand that brand allows you to move um what is normalcy what is the norm in an industry 
And this is a very significant point. This is something I mentioned very early on in the course with the example of uh, Murakami Haruki, for example, when his, his book Norwegian Wood became very successful. He led readers then to a whole range of literature, um, often certain you know, surreal stories that um, readers may not have otherwise embraced. So literally brands do help us to shift the culture uh, to shift practice in an industry. Nimor is the classic case of this to my mind in terms of product development. Renowned for sturdy luggage, the aesthetics of its product really strongly associated with those reinforced alloy cases um, and also parallels with the beauty of early modern aircraft. Very strong art deco and modernist references. They're not the same thing, but one feeds into the other. Um, anyone from the Bauhaus would have very much recognized Limour's um, sensibility in many ways as their own. Quite an exclusive high-end product, although in Germany, it's a regular department store brand as well. Um, but that's partly a German consumer behavior dynamic. The German market, um, even people who are very price sensitive in so many segments, for example, in food in eating out and whatnot, still have a very strong sense of investing in quality, in consumer electronics, in cars, in luggage and whatnot. So it's not as exclusive in Germany um, as it is outside Germany. You know, for the same reason you go to Germany and all the taxis and Mercedes and BMWs and whatnot, um, it's quite normal. Um, but uh, these are considered to be high-end products in other markets. So Limo has been in many ways one of the most dynamic firms in the luggage sector, enormous growth in sales, been very good at managing um, its brand expansion into new markets such as China, for example. We'll come back to that in a moment. What is very striking with Limo, Limo is it created a new polycarbon ultra lightweight product. Now the vast majority of Limo products these days that are owned, bought and owned, are actually not metal they are polycarbonate, okay? These have been hugely successful products. And lots of people are kind of aspirational in terms of the metal ones. They are more expensive, but we're not hugely more expensive. But a lot of people, they try them out and then they look at the weight difference and then they kind of compromise, even if they can afford the, uh, the metal ones, they compromise and they buy the polycarbonate because as a saleswoman in Limor store in Baden Baden in Germany said to me when I said oh it's only two kilos difference and she said two kilos is a lot of t-shirts um, and it is quite a striking point okay so what we've seen is that Limor has been able to refresh its product okay and because it had a reputation for sturdiness, for robustness, it could actually lead a product revolution. And it has been a revolution, okay? Um, these are pictures of some of my Dimor, by the way. Uh, this is one of the uh, really old ones. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have a TSA lock on it, uh, which means I can't lock it if I go to um, America or whatever. Um, but it's kind of become so retro now that people quite literally stop me and ask me if I'll sell it to them. This has happened to me several times. Uh, because it's got such a cool, cool uh, look to it. So the striking aesthetic, of course, bears um, resemblances to early aeroplanes. Um, and this imagery is taken from its um, homepage. And you can see that they've uh, stylized uh, uh, one of the head office buildings in Germany, literally in the corrugated metal that uh, mirrors the um, aesthetics of the product. Now, um, yeah, mine's kind of dirty, but uh, dirty's good. It shows you shows you've used it, okay? Um, but a really significant basic design point, rigidity needs rigidity, that if you actually have hard sides, and actually they're not that hard, they, they get bashed and you have to tap them out again sometimes. Actually, they can even get punctured, which is a bit painful, but hasn't happened to me yet. So rigidity needs rigidity. You need hard edges. So in the, in the, in the same way that a Mercedes-Benz um, or an Audi, uh, for example, was built in a very strong, heavy kind of way. Uh, and the sheer heaviness of some parts meant that all of it had to be kind of heavy and robust. Same with the suitcase. Uh, now the basic design principle here, and which really prompted rethinking in um, Limua, has been very much associated with the car industry. And I remember uh, many, many years ago, when I first came to Japan and I was teaching English uh, to Toyota's 
uh, head office in Toyota City in Nagoya. It's funny because I ended up responsible for the Nissan corporate gate study in Waseda. Um, I remember one of the young car designers, he was an engineer, but he moved into the design space. He'd said to me with this very powerful metaphor, and I'm always stuck in my mind, the power of a, of a metaphor. You know, he said, you know, those old big solid cars, um, you have a crash, you run into something. This is the image of the Volvo over Sweden, for example, and scarcely a dent in it, even though you slammed into something at 40 kilometers an hour. But he said, yeah, it's like tofu in a tin can. The, a human being is like the tofu. Human beings are soft. If the casing is very hard, um, you slam into the hard packaging and you get splattered inside the car. So this used to be quite routine. I remember as a kid, um, several times, some quite traumatic scenes where we slowed down on the highway, saw crashed cars. You looked and thought, oh, it doesn't look too bad. The car seems to be all right. And then you realize that there was someone in the car with a white sheet over them. Um, and it wasn't always white. Um, and you suddenly realize, hmm, especially you didn't have your seatbelt on in a very hard car. Of course, this is also the very sad, tragic dynamic, um, tragedy, tragic end of um, Lady Diana and Dodi Fayed as well, not wearing their seatbelts in, um, in a very hard car that's, that hit something very, very hard in Paris. So, the old car style suitcase, um, robust all round, had to be really robust um, where it's joined up. And this, of course, makes it heavier. The newer ones, and I, I think I've got five limo, various different models and whatnot. The, my, my, my most recent one is the, uh, the trunk shape, which is fantastically useful in very small hotel rooms. I resolved to buy one of them when I was in an Oslo hotel room where I just had no room to open even my relatively small limo trunk and because it sits deep, okay? Um, so dramatic difference in the weight, you halve the weight. And this particular model that came out, this is where they really went to a larger market. They branded it as Salsa, for example, the Salsa Air, these metaphors of lightness but also by shifting to material which absorbs a shock, hence modern design of cars, crumple zones. That's why you see car crashes now. You come on the side of the road and a car is, looks like it's absolutely destroyed and the people uh, got out without a scratch. This actually happened to my daughter last year. They hit some black ice on the way to snowboarding in Niigata. I, when I saw the pictures, I was horrified. I thought, my God, you know, um, you were nearly killed. She assured me her very serious boyfriend is a Nissan engineer that uh, they had no scratch on it because the car was designed to disintegrate in the way it was to absorb the shock so that the people didn't, inside didn't absorb the shock. By the way, he was driving a Mazda secretly, even though he works for Nissan because um, uh, he loved a nice Mazda sports car. Um, this is the same principle with the limo suitcase. Uh, it absorbs the shock. Therefore, you can go light all round. So you can use zippers to seal the thing. Now, of course, a lot of people saying, oh, okay, yeah, but I see these all the time. They're everywhere. Um, I go to Muji, Muji suitcases are the same. Exactly. Uh, the world has now embraced this. When Glimmer were first brought this out, people thought you're insane. A zipper, particularly my generation, I already men mentioned this, YKK, they revolutionized confidence in zips. When I was a kid, two or three times I had to get my mum replace the zips in my school shorts because the, the zipper had come, had busted. Seriously humiliating when you're nine in elementary school. Um, so a whole generation thought that's insane, okay? But a combination of quality zips, YKK, uh, from Japan, and soft casing can absorb this. But here's the fundamental point from a communication design perspective, that the ridges here in the polycarbonate actually serve no very serious structural purpose. And you see that so many other brands that have um, effectively copied the technology, they don't do ridges. Indeed, they wouldn't because they would get sued in the EU uh, because Limua has a trademark protection effectively on this. So when people look at this, they know instinctively that it's Limua. Um, because of the ridges, the bumpy element, which actually references the uh, structure of the old metal suitcases. If we uh, look back there, okay, we can see them side by side. So as I've already mentioned here, um, 
what you effectively have is clever branding, which highlights ease of movement and turning. My one really frustrating thing with my old Limor suitcase is it's got fixed back wheels. And so if I want the suitcase to turn in a corner, I have to go in a circle. I have to go in a circle while I pull it, but it's still worth it because it looks kind of cool. Okay. Now, the most interesting recent development, of course, is that um, uh, Limor has been taken over by Louis Vuitton, LVMH. And the story is effectively uh, CEO uh, Bernard Arnault um, of LVMH, his son was going off to study in, um, I think, NYU in New York. And his father saw him packaging his luggage, packing up his luggage before he went off and studied abroad and saw that he had a limo suitcase. And he said, what the hell? We own Louis Vuitton. Why are you not using our luggage? And he said, I prefer this. So as you do, if you're the richest man in France, um, you buy the company. So Bernard no, bought um, Limor for a huge undisclosed price and made his son CEO. So if you Google this, you'll find that the, uh, the CEO is about a 25 or 26 year old because uh, dad bought him the company. Good luck. Okay. Um, you go, dad can afford to do that and you love a product and you convince him to, uh, to buy the company. Great. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things with LVMH is they're extraordinarily good at leveraging brand and um, price controls across countries to really position it in an exclusive way. One of the problems they've got everywhere, but it's much more of a problem with, a suit, with say, the suitcases, for example, LVMH, is the sheer boom in the China market and particularly when you're in a suitcase business, what this means is that a lot of the product is going to be outward bound. So effectively, and some of you will have had this experience, you're checking out of a hotel lobby, and if you've got a large tour group, particularly wealthy uh, tourists from China, and all of the suitcases are all loaded up, you suddenly see 50, 60, 80 limo suitcases all kind of lined up. Um, by the way, you may have heard of this phenomena before, of course, COVID-19 completely shut down travel of huge numbers of suitcases being abandoned at um, Narita Airport, Haneda Airport and in Tokyo hotels. Uh, the reason has been that um, Limua suitcases are much, much cheaper in Japan than they are in China. So lots of tourists come with um, the crappiest old suitcase they want to get rid of. Uh, they come to Tokyo. They buy the new limo suitcases and they throw their old suitcases away. Uh, but generally in Japan, they treat these discarded property as potentially lost property for a number of months. So there are enormous warehouses um, stacked high with crappy suitcases out near Narita Airport, for example, waiting for three months so that they can be uh, thrown away. Okay, So there are a whole range of in interesting kind of challenges when your brand becomes so ubiquitous that it seems no longer exclusive. So you see Limo now is doing a lot of color variations and whatnot. Um, my own biggest objection to LVMH and uh, the, uh, the, the young CEO is that they decided to rationalize the product line around three sizes, which um, is S, M, and L. And for people who've actually got a number of Limo, um, they have effectively done away with intermediate size cases. So you either go for 60 liters, you go for something like 85 liters or a mega one, which hardly any airplanes will take anymore. So most people don't, don't buy, so they don't generally sell them, except in a couple of, couple of lineups. So the intermediate products, uh, they've kind of abandoned that space. And so a lot of people have been looking for something other than Limor uh, to better uh, satisfy their, their particular suitcase lineup. Um, there's a more general observation, particularly with handbags. Um, you kind of, you can never have too many handbags in a way for a very simple reason that every single trip, every single day, you have slightly different functional kind of um, imperatives. So although I uh, tend to mock um, my better half for having enough handbags to actually start a museum, I find myself having an enormous range of kaban um, just for different purposes. And so we see this with suitcases as well. One of the clever things that um, startup company Away has done um, has a really successful brand. You can check it out, A-W-A-Y. Come in much, much cheaper, learn some lessons from Limua. Um, 
all of their suitcases fit inside their other suitcases. Strangely, Nimawa has done this with their S, M and L lineup, but they haven't told anybody, which is a really, really big missed opportunity. That you, particularly, say, in the Japanese market, the S fits in the M, fits inside the L, and you can put them away. So they actually thought of that in terms of a nice design thinking way, and that's one reason why they rationalized their lineup, but then they forgot to tell the customers that most elementary thing. Whereas if you go to the away um, homepage and look at the top, the top page there, the, the, uh, the video that you land on, they actually show people literally putting away the suitcases and sliding it under the bed, making a feature of that. Okay, now I'm going to turn over to a broader discussion of spatiality. Ah, okay, I'm seeing some nice messages. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do I think of Limua's new, new logo? Um, mm, I, I, I like that one. I do, yeah, I, I, I like the simplistic black on white, um, although it kind of immediately dated any, any Limua that didn't have it, actually. And I guess that's one reason why they very deliberately did it. Because actually one of the, uh, the problems with Limua is that there's a huge um, parallel market of older products. And so by redesigning the logo, um, it kind of drew a line under this. And they, of course, LVMH put the prices up. Um, so if you go, for example, into Kormikyo in Shinjuku, you can see Limua suitcases, which are still very much the same specs as in the past. Um, they've got the older logo and you can buy them for a little bit of a premium. Um, but yeah, they've done this anagram kind of thing with the pointy bit and everything. And I, I don't know, I think that's a, mm, I don't like that. Um, but just the straight limo, I kind of, kind of like. Um, and yes, the supreme collaboration. Oh, that's hot. Sorry, guys. I know there'll be a bunch of people out there who like Supreme, but for me, um, I'm sorry. Supreme for me, maybe I'm just getting old, but Supreme just looks brand victim to me. Okay. And so, yeah, I agree entirely. And, um, my take on that is that's the kind of mistake that a 25 year old CEO makes. You know, you want to connect with the cool kids. Um, the, uh, there's actually, and I, and I don't want to be nasty, but if you go onto Instagram and kind of look at taglines like trash kids and whatnot, there's a whole genre of photographs of rich, spoiled, brats behaving badly in airports you know uh, i've actually got one i took myself <laughs> um, of um feet up on the limo suitcase in the airport with the baseball cap backwards and the uh, the supreme sweatshirt and eating um cup noodles um in the business class lounge you know um and got, you know got the got the tickets with you know Actually, I know the person approaches <laughs> troubles with dad's free flight points, but that's cool. Uh, yeah, who? Uh, yeah. So this is the real problem for Limor. How, how how do you stay classy in the really German positioning while reaching out with other collaboration? And uh, the dangers of brand extension that uh, you trace. Uh, you yeah, sorry, you chase every bit of short to short term revenue. Um, and in the end, really cheapening the brand. It's the kind of the D&G belt buckle as a kind of a, a, a sign of being a drug dealer, you know, around Les Isles in Paris or something like that. So, yeah, um, complex kind of issues there. Okay. Um, right. Wow. Okay. Um, and... A, uh, one of the students has posted a really cool message and you say here, sorry, professor, not to brag, but actually my mother's uncle, Noriaki Yokosuka was a photographer and he did the Shiseido and Parkour campaign during the 60s and 70s working with Eiko Ishioka. You are allowed to brag. That is seriously amazing. Wow. Okay. Um, Yokosuka Noriaki is a seriously famous um, photographer and that's an, a really creative period. Um, and that's why I've put uh, some of the videos as well. You can see there some of the really edgy stuff that Shiseido and Paco were doing. Um, by comparison, it's kind of boring now. I actually uh, met at a very nice party. Uh, one of the top creative directors for Shiseido 
uh, we had this conversation and he said, well, Kuyashi, the haunting Kuyashi, you know, that he loved all this work. He was, he's about the same age as me and that's why he uh, joined Shiseido. But um, caution has really taken hold in the Japanese market in terms of doing edgy, every edgy communications. Um, and the previous people like Serge Lutens, the um, French creative director for Shiseido for a long time, very interesting character. And um, those of you in my Zemi, we're actually going to be talking about Serge Lutens this week. Um, I've got a um, huge attachment to Sasha Tans because we've worked with creator Christopher Sheldrake on fragrance, my favorite show, um, fragrance brand by far. Um, but also, he has the same birthday as me, Sankatsu Jiyoka. Um, although, another missed opportunity, I have never, Shiseido now owns Sir Shotans, and I've never seen them use his birthday as a kikake for a White Day campaign. Hey, it's White Day, Sasha Tans was born on 14th of March. Buy this for me, okay? Right, okay, now let's go over to the discussion of spatiality. Okay, um, space and architecture. That seems to me just have a swig of water and dehydrate. Just seems so obvious, right? Isn't architecture about creating space? Well, actually, historically, architects, um, although they, uh, for example, medieval architects excelled spectacularly at this, um, a lot of what they did wasn't, in, at least in the last couple of centuries, necessarily conceptualized at it particularly uh, with the neoclassical architectural influences. They were more, much, much more concerned about form and golden mean and established norms of what looked good, much less so about thinking about actually con um, creating spaces per se. So they did to great effect, but this wasn't their dominant narrative. Um, of course, intuitive space design has been absolutely critical to the specification, to the, uh, the defining um, the celebration of sacred places, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So the formal concept of space really only enters architectural thinking from German writers, particularly the late 19th century and in very influential in the 1920s, um, and the very rich usage of the German word um, Raum. Of course, medieval cathedrals, though, provide um, an astonishing example of how space can lift the human spirits, of course, upwards and uh, to evoke the enormous enormity of the heavens, of God's power, of God's influence, um, to raise us up above ourselves. Okay. Um, and very, very long history of this. Um, <clears throat> this is actually Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, very striking Christian images there from the Eastern Orthodox Church style. You can see there's a whole bunch of clues. Those are familiar with the Orthodox Church would recognize this. This is actually very significant because it's a mosque now. And if you can look over to the left there, you can see actually um, Islamic motifs. Uh, but uh, when uh, Istanbul fell to the Turks, they had the, um, the good taste to leave a lot of the Christian iconography. <clears throat> and indeed, Islam um, has incorporated the New Testament into its, into its teaching from Prophet Muhammad. Excuse me one more time. And so there are, there are very interesting kind of workarounds that they used there. Um, and obviously an astonishing space that uh, dates back to, I think, about the 5th century that it was built. Okay. Um, now, we often evoke the sacred uh, through a space of exclusion. I've already mentioned once uh, the famous uh, adage about um, Isi Jingu, Isi Shrine. Um, there's nothing to see and you're not allowed to see it. The whole idea that, that it's, it's nothingness, it's mu, um, and the definition of nothingness is everything, and its sacredness rests in the absence of any distracting material element. And there is, a, there is an element of this, of course, in traditional Jewish thought as well, this, the, the holy of the holies, um, Kodesh Kodeshim, the, uh, the most sacred space in the Jewish temple in the first and the second temple that was destroyed by the Romans um, uh, was effectively also understood as being empty. It was, a, it was a home for God to come. Okay. So we see this, of course, with the, uh, the toddy. This is uh, actually uh, Yaskuni shrine. So please don't pile on me politically about this. Okay. Um, quite strikingly, of course, uh, that is the Imperial crest. And that's actually quite controversial. Yaskuni shrine that they use that technically without permission. Um, 
but as you know, whenever you you, you approach a shrine, um, there is a, a boarded space and you step over the threshold, for example. And you approach this and clearly there are zones as you go closer and closer and closer in, um, you approach the, uh, the source of the, uh, the sacred. Okay, so um, a little bit in terms of space and space in theory, let's briefly look at um, one of the leading German um, writers on this. He's actually a sculptor. I'll read this. By a spatial continuum, we mean space is three-dimensional extension and there's a three-dimensional mobility or kinesthetic activity of our imagination. Its most essential attribute is continuity. Let us therefore imagine the spatial continuum as a body of water in which we can submerge containers and thus define individual volumes as specifically formed individual bodies without losing the conception of the whole as one continuous body of water. Now that seems obscure, but then think about it. This is like that classic um, eureka moment of understanding that you can uh, take the measure of the volume of an object by the water it displaces, okay? Um, you know, in a, in a freaky kind of way, if you think about this in terms of COVID-19, that if we we're all sitting in a room together, we would be all items in this common space of air, okay? Which actually extends into us and out of us in ways that you really don't want to think about uh, in the middle of a potentially fatal pandemic, okay? Um, now, conceptually, why is this meaningful? Well, it realizes that when you place some, wait, that there is displacement, that when you place something into a space, it changes the entirety of the outlines of the space. Um, actually, with uh, 3D scanning now, you can end up with um, this is something equivalent to a slip mold that uh, you can scan um, and the outlines of all the objects of anything that sits in a room in terms of the container in which it's in. So it becomes this kind of defined single space. And there have been some interesting art projects on this where people have literally taken a mold of an entire room um, and then actually chipped away the things around it. So some of the insights actually on this conceptually come from things like the excavations in Pompeii. I remember in Pompeii, um, when you see these pictures of the, the excruciating dying dog, for example, you know, that's, that wasn't frozen in stone. It was actually an empty, it was an empty space. What happened was all of the victims of Pompeii were covered in ash. Uh, they decayed, the ash solidified, and then it left these empty spaces. And so the very meticulous process of molding these spaces, so they, they poured uh, uh, a filler in and let it set, and then excavated it. And so effectively, it is a model then of the reverse space. It gives you an outline of what we have there what used to be there. Now, a lot of building historically was very externally oriented. It was about showing power, for example. It, exter it, it communicated through external experience. Tended wanted to project gravitas, this wonderful um, Latinate Italian word, sense of gravity, dignity, okay? You know, if you think of an actor, someone like say Jeremy Irons has gravitas, okay? Um, to project elegance. And of course, uh, this notion of amassing of the structures, uh, which is very striking in Europe, the fully built street or the square, it defines a space which is open, but it, the ambience of the space is a function of the facades and the forms that actually uh, line it, okay? Um, uh, interacted very nicely with our Zemise a couple of weeks ago. One of our Zemise, she shared this picture of an absolutely beautiful sofa. And of course, my immediate reaction was the problem with having a sofa like that in your home is you have to have someone very beautiful to lie on it. Like if you're married to, you know, a really slobby guy who just lies around um, in his track decks, it's like betraying the space. In a similar kind of way, the regulation of the public appearances of architecture in Europe is conceded, considered to be a civic duty and not a violation of individual rights to build whatever you want. You know, you want to build a big pink sausage shaped building um, and the city says no, because you are defining the spatiality of the city in a way that's really offensive to the rest of us. So your individual rights must be sacrificed to the, you know, the interests of everyone who inhabit this open space. 
Um, in Japan, uh, the regulation of structures comes down almost solely to its uh, structural rigidity. If it doesn't fall over in an earthquake, there's really not much to stop you building a pink sausage shaped house and your poor, poor neighbors. Okay. Uh, what we often do see with space is that it's deliberately left as a void in an otherwise heavily constructed site. So it can be very evocative, just as silence in the place of noise um, is. And if you look at the, the modernist composition of, say, a composer like uh, Takamitsu, a Japanese classical composer, you see a similar thing. Modernism very much understands this. You know, it's what's not struck constructed. It's what is not rendered. It's what is left open can be as evocative. And actually, Japanese aesthetics had a very significant um, impact on this. It's often defined as, you know, in terms of Zen, it's what is not there, the Mu, the nothingness, is very often more evocative than what might be placed there. So, of course, all built structures have functional imperatives, but they also communicate values. Sometimes it can be just a really basic functionalism. Sometimes it can be really kitsch sentimentality far too often. Okay. Um, you know, the Parthenon um, really, obviously, it was a place of worship, but also projected the authority of Athens. Um, and in a perpetual state of renovation, that's what happens with EU funding. <laughs> it just goes on forever. Um, of course, new materials present new ways to define spaces um, from a functional point of view, but also give rise to new aesthetics. So there was a lot of controversy, for example, with the development of steel and glass. Uh, the first major structure for this was actually for the um, International Exposition with the, the building of the Crystal Palace in London in, I th think, 1851, don't hold me to it. Um, and actually, the UK led the world in this for a while. Um, you can see this is, this is Paddington Railway Station, for example, um, and is now very much um, beloved aesthetic. So facades, I think we, we all get. Uh, you walk around cities that really value the role of the facades in defining this, this sense of shared public space is very significant. I've just got a lot of images which speak to this, various places. Um, that's Vienna. Uh, uh, this one is Tokyo. This is a little bit of Daitoa, uh, Greater East Japan, um, Imperial Bombast, um, built in the 1920s in, you can see it in um, Jingu, uh, Gaien. Okay, it is the major memorial picture gallery that uh, the famous um, painting of Emperor Meiji promulgating the Meiji constitution that's in every uh, Nihonshi, every Japan history textbook. You can see in here, all the great artists of the day were invited to paint various scenes in the Meiji, uh, Meiji reign, and no one was gonna say no. Uh, so it's a very mixed, uh, mixed array of art. A lot of it is a little bit too much kind of um, realism for me, but anyway verging on a bit of socialist realism in some kind of way, um, nationalist realism at, in some points. Um, but clearly it is a bold structure. There was a, it was a political state. This um, building took on this very particular form, presented this facade that it did um, to demonstrate, uh, particularly when Japan was turning in a slightly more authoritarian way, although this was commissioned in the late Taisho period, it projected authority. Similarly, in, uh, when the capital of a unified Germany was returned to Berlin, and a lot of new buildings had to be built. There was a big debate about the appropriate materiality. And so we see that major buildings built in Berlin are made of glass rather than stone. Glass um, implied transparency, stone authoritarianism from an inappropriate era. Uh, of course, there are around the place a whole bunch of kind of nazo um, uh, structures. This is one near Yaskuni Shrine. It's with some obscure nationalistic organization. Very strangely, I snapped this picture and about 30 seconds later, someone ran out and told me quite forcefully I was not allowed to take pictures. And I thought, why not? You build this clearly very bold entrance, this facade, you wanna say something, why would you not allow someone to take pictures? suggests to me that deep down they know that actually their political message is a little bit, hmm, or at very least when they see a blonde head, well, not that blonde these days, don't get to surf anymore. Um, uh, Westerner, they may suspect that um, I have cynical purposes. Um, I could take the piss out of them now, but I'm not going to, even though they told me not to take a picture. 
Okay, space and form defining it. Um, this is quite significant when you're actually rearranging your living room and um, lots of people can uh, get into fights with their flatmates um, over about defining space uh, to a remarkable degree. You don't need to border space three dimensionally. All you need to do is to have a 2D evocation of it. Putting a picnic mat down in the middle of a very big field defines your space, for example. If you had a picnic mat out and some stranger walked by and put their hand over your picnic mat, it would kind of feel like they suddenly crashed your bedroom, right? It's, it would be like a space violation, even though um, all you've done is effectively to draw um, laws on, the, to draw some lines on the ground. Similarly, you can define separate spaces just simply by putting a mat down on the floor. I think we all understand um, how that works. Um, you can create, break up a very large space. Modernists played a lot with this because they moved towards open plan in houses and then had to deal with the consequences of this, okay? So we inhabit space, but its perceived boundaries are defined by elements of form, which are either built or evoked, okay? So horizontal planes can define spaces, as I say here. Um, similarly, you can do interesting things by variations in material, in color, elevation, or a whole range of things. Um, hotel rooms in um, Asia, where lots of customers take their shoes off, very often use different floor coverings in the narrow entrance into the hotel room. Um, and then once you cross into the room proper, it's a different floor covering, maybe maybe a vinyl versus a uh, a carpet or two tones of carpet, um, just because people want to have a distinction between the inside um, and the outside. Where there isn't, people tend to imagine that there is a definition, that there is a definition. Sim simply maybe if you've got a narrow corridor and then it opens out into the room, it's where at the point of the opening out, we consider that a boarded space, okay? Um, from a very famous book on this, um, architectural writer, um, articles of furnishings, can either stand as forms within a field or space or serve to define the form of a spatial field. The sofa is a, is a very effective way of defining, defining a room, even if it's a relatively low sofa, for example. We see that. And of course, then you place a rug, a coffee table, a chair and whatnot, and you can play with this. Um, modernist architects fell a, a lot back on this. Uh, one of the most iconic modernist architects in really pushing along um, the breaking down of boundaries within buildings. Uh, open space was Mies van der Rohe, head of the Bauhaus. Um, he was the uh, second head, the founder. Um, uh, first of all, left to get away from the Nazis, um, Walter Gropius. Mies van der Rohe stayed on for a while and he ultimately fled too. Both of them became very prominent key modernist architects in uh, the United States. Uh, transforming the skyline, Chicago, for example, really transforming architecture globally through spreading modernism. Mies van der Rohe was very famous for the Barcelona Pavilion in 1929. Um, this is before the Nazis came to power. The Weimar government embraced a radical modernist um, pavilion for Germany. It was the World Exposition was in Barcelona. And if you're curious on this, how politics gets in the way of architectural representation and how clearly architecture is a communicative act, Google what Nazi Germany did in terms of its architectural choices representing Germany at subsequent international exhibitions. So they turn their back on modernism, which is um, considered to be kind of radical, um, and hostile to the Germanic project. Uh, although ironically, some individual um, people who collaborated with the Nazis nonetheless still had modernist architects design their homes. So this is actually a reproduction, but a very accurate reproduction in Barcelona. If you get to see it, the original was knocked down, unfortunately. So we see open space, um, but definition of space with interesting use of materials. And a lot of people wrongly associate modernism as just cold, um, bare concrete, for example, as heartless. But what we see very clever, clever use of materials, um, that by the way is the, uh, the famous Barcelona chair that Mies van der Rohe also designed for the space, the copyright's now up, so you can see um, very crappy copies sold for even just a couple of months these days on, um, 
uh, Amazon and whatnot. So open spaces where the, and this is the critical thing. Uh, minimalism, simplicity requires higher quality finishes, not less. Okay. Uh, we generally know that ornamentation is there to hide poor building quality. Um, the edging that you put around the, uh, bottom of a wall or the top of top of a wall, for example, where it meets the ceiling, where the craftsmen are really, really slack and nothing doesn't join, nothing joins up properly. You just simply uh, stick some uh, what we call fascia boards. Literally, they, they, they put a face on them uh, to hide poor craftsmanship. Simple things require a very high quality materiality and a very high quality of finish. This is one reason why architects like to dress in black. They say if you reduce it to black, uh, you can't distract with color. Uh, the form has to be perfect. The material has to be excellent. Okay, so just some more images. Of course, these architectural forms are so familiar to us now. Um, I want to show you a new one. Um, and if this provokes a little bit of dissatisfaction with Wasada, then I'm fine with that. Um, this is a university in Lausanne, okay, uh, EPFL. And actually, I know several SIL students have gone on to graduate programs here. Uh, this is designed by one of Japan's most famous architectural firms, Sana. Um, they have done a number of very interesting kind of campus projects and uh, overseas. Um, unfortunately, Waseda would never dream of commissioning them. <laughs> just look what we do. Uh, we just get some Zinicon uh, to throw up a box and we stick some brick facade on it. And literally the bricks on building 11 were bolted on. I watched them screw them on. They were assembled in a factory. They're only about that thick. Okay. Um, some bricks glued onto concrete. Uh, this is they call the learning center. Most libraries these days in universities are actually called learning centers. This is a student center. Um, if you go to the University of Lausanne, um, you get to hang out here and do your group work. Okay, now that's pretty cool. And of course the students get very kind of creative with this. Um, so they did a nice um, photo shoot, um, looking like they're going snowboarding or skiing. Okay, um, Copenhagen University, similarly, very much investing in impressive spaces where students can come together and work. Um, and of course speak with a very particular architectural language. It's very Scandi, very Scandinavian. If anyone's been through Copenhagen airport, it's my very favorite in terms of, nah, Oslo is my very favorite. Um, Copenhagen is second. Um, Copenhagen is very good, but it's been kind of messed up by the annoying Australian investment bankers, which run it um, because they have filled it with a whole range of very tacky, um, retail spaces which distract from the very nice architecture, particularly the older, um, wonderful modernist uh, terminal there. Um, so anyway, you see very distinctive signature here with um, wood. What's very nice about both Copenhagen and Oslo airports is you actually walk on bare polished wood underfoot um, rather than in uh, Japan where you slip over concrete with bad carpet on top of it. Um, University of Copenhagen, by the way, this is student accommodation um, done by one of the most renowned architectural firms um, in Denmark. I looked at this and I thought, how can I sign up as an undergraduate student at the University of Copenhagen and apply to live in the student accommodation? This is so much nicer than what I live in in Tokyo. Okay. Now, a little bit stepping back, just in terms of defining spaces as um, art projects, for example. Uh, this is one that was at the uh, Triennale in uh, it, uh, Ichiro Tsumari Art Triennale, where archi architects play with this idea of space and defining space with an architectural intervention, just simply by putting up walls. And you know, the uh, the maze is the classic example of this. Um, then what do you do with the space? Uh, again, back in Copenhagen, there's this wonderful museum, Copenhagen Contemporary. It was this huge space where they used to um, build ships undercover and it's been turned into contemporary art space. And so we're seeing more of this, this repurposing 
of former factories and whatnot, and then inviting artists to create installations for it. So it's having a huge impact on the practice of art because of the massive spaces that um, now exist that made available. Now, we can, on the one hand, we have the, these, these big found and given spaces. On the other hand, we can define space. And Japan has a very fine tradition of this with the matsuri, for example, putting up the lamp, the lanterns, we immediately know from a distance it's a matsuri, um, but also boundering the, the space with the way we put them up, okay? This is actually across, that's building 19 at Waseda. And if you cross the street, there's, um, if you haven't discovered it when next year on campus, when we are back on campus regularly, um, there is a very nice ginger uh, to be found across from building 19 and also a wonderful Japanese garden, which has been around from the Edo period, um, which is now run by Shinjuku Ward. Art projects sometimes play with the way that we define views, um, the science backwards, but here they actually invite people to look through the window at the view um, with, a, with an ironic gesture. Okay, so I will turn next to um, the question of designing communicative spaces. Let me just open this up. This is a rather heavy file. It's about 70 um, meg because it's got a lot of images in it. I could have reduced the quality of the PDF, um, but precisely because the visuality is a significant part of it, that didn't seem to make sense. So be alert to it if you're down, downloading it on a, uh, off a um, rationed internet connection. You might want to wait till you're at, uh, at home. Oops, no. um, I want to go to here. Okay, this week. So when we start with the recognition of the potency of space, um, and we then approach communicative uh, endeavors, designing them for corporates, uh, a whole range of opportunities and challenges are going to arise. Um, first of all, basic 3D branding gestures, we really have to make the most of packaging. We understand that. Um, there's a tactile dimension. How does the package feel to touch and hold? So it's not just purely about visuality. Um, it's very much how this material feels in your hand. Okay. Um, when products are sold through retail price, uh, spaces directly, there is great opportunity to promote emotional engagement. That's why I don't think the physical retail space is ever going to die simply because there are there's some products that they just simply sell themselves by, by, either the package or the product itself, the way it feels in your hand, the attachment you, uh, you form to it, it becomes very persuasive. You pick it up and you don't want to put it, put it down. By the way, in psychology, there's an, there's an endowment effect. We know that um, if people have handled a product, they're often prepared to pay a higher price for it in an auction than if they've not actually touched it. It's a strange thing. It's like you touch a child um, and you feel an emotional connection. You, t you hold a coffee cup in your hand and strangely, um, people will uh, not want to give it up subsequently. It's kind of physically almost yours in some mental sense, okay? Of course, shopping bags are a classic example of this. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you have this experience of having a shopping bag that's so nice, you don't want to throw it away. Um, and so we carefully reuse them. Uh, don't be one of those people though, who just keeps using that Louis Vuitton shopping bag to nearly falls apart because you want to show people that you've been shopping at Louis Vuitton. It, um, it certainly will be deliberate how you use it, but like so many deliberate acts we do, uh, it has to look accidental. It's like, oh, this whole thing. Oh, Louis Vuitton, I hadn't noticed. Okay, probably it's a little bit too fake. Okay, um, so packaging can be an additional source of delight for the customer after the product has won the person's commitment. So you play with the product, you want it, and then lo and behold, it comes to an even nice box. This is the Apple experience. You go to the Apple store, the store itself is a remarkable space. Um, there's nice wood to lean on while well, you kept waiting forever and get really crap attitude from a bunch of Kikoksu Choshi Notaru staff members. I had this conversation with one class member here. Um, I love Apple products, I love Apple stores, but almost every time I leave an Apple store in Tokyo, I'm really annoyed because of the crap attitude of some of the Apple staff. And if some of you work for Apple, you can contest that or you can tell me why it is. Um, but a little bit of advice. Um, someone comes in, 53 years old, don't bro them. Hey, bro. It's like, bro. 
I am not your bro, I am your customer, please. Okay. Um, so don't, don't mistake the, uh, the stature of the product and it's billions in the bank for your own stature as an employee. Okay. So packaging design challenges. First and foremost, it's actually got to protect the product. And so we tend not to give enough attention to the astonishing work that package designers do. Um, it's not just protecting the product, it actually has to efficiently stack to minimize volume in transport. Uh, we get this in transit, um, but it also has to fit very neatly together. And the key planning parameter is if ship, things are shipped in shipping containers, you work back from the volume of the shipping container to the size of the package because um, not necessarily iPhones, they're actually shipped very often by air freight, um, but for a whole bunch of things, the boxes get packed together, uh, the individual packages get packed together, they get put in boxes, and all of those boxes, when they slide into containers, shipping containers, there is no movement. Things get damaged, and it's very important when you're moving house, remember this, things get damaged when they can move, when they move backwards and forwards. So you just fit is the way you want to do this. So the planning parameters for packaging design are incredibly tight. And then it has to work aesthetically as well. It's got to capture the eye of the consumer. It's got to cohere, reinforce with the brand values. It's also got to speak to the environmental credentials of the firm. And it's got to meet a lot of regulatory requirements. Um, if we think spatially and get away from the simple two-dimensional messaging, you can do some interesting creative things. SodaStream is a very interesting one of this. They've managed to communicate a, um, a good value proposition with their product. Um, they've managed to completely infuriate Coca-Cola, which is another major achievement. Um, I would not be without my SodaStream machine, especially in this season. I, I, um, I've just had to replace the gas canister for the, um, this particularly stay at home. I'm getting through them once a month. Um, but you make unlimited soda water. Effectively, you take water from the tap, um, make the soda and then you, you mix it up. Okay. So no schlepping back from the combini with bottles of drink, no having things delivered, no having to throw away bottles, um, perfect recycling. Okay. Um, and very economical. So what they did was at Coca-Cola's head office in Atlanta, they put a huge cage full of Coca-Cola empties in front of their head office, which went spectacularly viral as well. They simply say, Buying pre-mixed drinks in disposable containers is irresponsible, okay? Um, and so you see these kind of campaigning. So no lugging stuff around, no batteries, and then they come up with some statistics. Um, here, they sh this was a Chicago case. One typical family in five years, um, uh, how many containers would they dispose of? One family, five years, 10,657 bottles and cans. Um, Whereas if you use one soda stream container, you have one bottle, um, maybe two if you get through them quickly and you need it refrigerated. Okay, so super efficient. Now let's turn briefly to retail spaces and I'm, I want to get through this and I won't cover all of this today, but I want to cover um, some of the, uh, the broad issues. Um, when we talk about retail spaces, uh, there's a couple of basic parameters. Are we talking about a single versus a multi-brand? This has a lot of implications. Is it select shop, for example, versus a single brand? A single brand, there can be a very direct alignment with the branding and visual identity of the brand. Okay, you go into Limoa, and it's designed to communicate Limoa. You go into an Apple store, and um, it's all about the Apple product, and obviously the, uh, the design of the store very much coheres with the aesthetics of the products multi-brands get much more complicated. And this is actually one reason why department stores struggle incredibly. Um, because it's very, very difficult unless you actually take a department store and split it up into a lot of little spaces and create kind of claustrophobic booth-like distinctive brand experiences and therefore lose the coherence of the overall store. If you wanna see a classic example of how this has been done, I think very, very poorly, go to Takashimaya. Um, on the first and second floor um, in Shinjuku, uh, where they've got all of these different branded spaces, but you cannot see from one end of the space to the other. In contrast, Selfridges, um, which was done by the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, Rem Kuhas's outfit, and actually a uh, guy who used to teach architecture at Waseda worked on it, um, they have very creative, 
cleverly created multi-branded spaces in Selfridges, which still keep the openness of the store as a whole by a kind of mid-height division, okay? Select stores are a bit different because they're actually curating, they're selecting. So they pick a subset of brands that they can cohere around their aesthetic. So if you go to Beams Plus, it's a mixture of their own product and various created uh, product. Department stores, it's really difficult. So what do you end up doing? You, you either seek neutrality, which is risky and it's dullness. Um, you try and communicate an ethos appealing to a particular target market and scare other people off and have constant fights with brands that you want in your store or not. Or do you create multiple zones of ambience? Um, I would say Isitan, um, and particularly Isitan men's have managed to do this probably the best in Tokyo. And then finally, there is this permanent versus temporary spatial presence. And I've just got a couple of pictures here. Very successful brand, Barmuda. Um, sorry, no, Balmuda, sorry. I got, like, wow, you an English native speaker who screws up L and R, Katakana Barmuda, Balmuda, B-A-L-M-U-D-A, forgive me. Okay, um, I have two of these products, by the way, They're both of them, left and right, they're both extraordinarily good. Okay, um, and then things like the motor shows and whatnot, and this step up, um, step, um, pop-up kind of temporary space um, where you're projecting the brand. So finally, just to finish for today, when we think of the flagship store, um, this is where you get to project your product very distinctly. This is Aprica, which is actually a Japanese baby car brand, but um, this is in Milan. And clearly the product they feature there in the, uh, the window probably wouldn't be a bestseller in Japan. In fact, I've never seen um, that pattern here in Tokyo because people are just so cautious with what they buy for kids here. Um, but they've done extraordinarily well in Italy. So I'll come back to this next week, run through some of these images very briefly. We'll uh, leave it there. So thank you very much for joining. Um, I'll hang around. If people have got questions, I've got some time. I probably should have to bail about five o'clock because a bit after that, I've got to do a, a Zoom meeting with some folks. But uh, I'm here for a while if people uh, want to ask questions. So thank you very much. All right.